But the, book, the good book says all things work together for good to those who love the Lord. So again, uh, for those of you in the chat and those of you who are the Art Chung Center, let's bow our heads in prayer, please. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for this opportunity where we can come and discuss these matters, O oh God, of territorial sovereignty and land disputes. We ask for your guidance and your direction. And we pray, O oh God, that today as we speak, O oh God, that you will bless our speakers with your anointing, that you will fill them with your Holy Spirit as they prepare to and deliver their messages. May their words resonate with clarity, conviction, and passion, fostering constructive dialogue and cooperation. Lord, we commit this conference to you, trusting that all our plans will be established by you. As we ask it in your name, amen. We will now listen to the National Anthem. Thank you very much. I We are still having some challenges here because the anthem was played, but unfortunately we were unable to, to hear it. So enough time has gone already, so we will, we will, we will proceed. We will proceed and, um, you know, our, our, our first speaker today is the Honorable Minister. So yeah, Parag and I will ask one of my students to uh, sorry. Look, Dr. Acha, are you on? Yes, yes. Uh, oh, you... I'm sorry. My 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 deepest apologies. My yeah, deepest I'm, apologies. I'm, that's all right. I'm 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 uh, I'm using the, the president's uh, connection right now. Um yes. uh, before we before we proceed with that, you say that the anthem was already played? Yes. Yes, yes. okay. Um, so I, I'd like to introduce uh, uh, the president of the University of the Southern Caribbean, Dr. Colwick Grayson, to give a few remarks, and he will introduce uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Parag.
Uh, good morning, everyone. I am excited about this event that has been organized today. As you know, the University of the Southern Caribbean is located, its main campus is located in Maracas Valley in Trinidad. Uh, however, we have a number of extension campuses that include uh, the campus in Guyana. We are, folk, we are here today in part uh, because of our one of its kind Masters of Science in National Security and Intelligence Studies program here at the university. And in that regard, I want to thank the Dean of the Graduate School, uh, Dr. Uh, Lena Caesar, and uh, the coordinator of the program, Dr. Mohabir. Our provost uh, just made the introduction, uh, who has been uh, coordinating and quarterbacking this, this effort. And our provost, as you know, is responsible for all things academic. And together with uh, our Vice President for Student Services and Enrollment uh, Services, uh, doc Dr. Pastor Onesi Lafleur, I want to thank him also, uh, along with the team, uh, for ensuring that we have this going. Especially, I want to pay mention to our uh, uh, students in the Master's of Science in National Security and Intelligent Studies program. It is very clear that USC, having been around the, the landscape of the Caribbean, and specifically here in Trinidad, for over 96 years, the big part of our, of our value system includes engaging the community and being directly a part of what happens around us. In that regard, our mission, our motto, uh, points to the fact that we are mission-driven uh, to ensure that our students are not only prepared for what we consider our theological belief, but includes uh, what we believe to be a practical theology in terms of fitness and readiness uh, for service in the society. In that regard, uh, we believe that there is need for the public to continuously be engaged and informed about national and regional issues. Uh, the issue of the Venezuela-Guyana border one is certainly a national issue, and uh, we think it's important uh, to have conversations like these that allow uh, for information sharing that will clarify often the misunderstandings that are otherwise cherished. And so I'm excited uh, in part for all of those reasons, and I thank uh, the organizers and spe specifically I want to say to all of you who have uh, decided to join uh, this program today, welcome, welcome to the program, and uh, welcome to the University of the Southern Caribbean. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Archer. You have to unmute Dr. Acha. Um, I... okay. I can unmute now. Um... She should so I can do the battle. Hello? Hello?
Um, it is my uh, privilege to introduce uh, the speaker, uh, the Honorable Savitri Sonia Parag, who is uh, today representing the president, uh, all protocols formally observed. Uh, Ms. Parag, originally from the Asipibo coast, was uh, born in Suri, where she resided for 13 years and attended a school. She attained uh, Queen's College in 1994, or went on to attend President's College. Then she entered the University of Ghana in 1999 as an English major, and subsequently went on to pursue law from 2002 to 2005 at the University of Guyana, where she obtained a Bachelor of Law degree. She then advanced to the high, to, to, sorry, the Hugh Wooding Law School from 2005 to 2007, where she obtained her certificate to practice law. The Honorable Parag was admitted to the legal bar in October of 2007 and was in private practice from 2007 to 2020. She was then sworn in as a member of parliament and the minister of the public service on, in August of 2020, and that portfolio she currently holds. As a member of parliament, the Honorable Parag sits on the Parliamentary Management Committee and the Constitutional Reform Committee. Additionally, Honorable Parag is presently serving in her second term as a member of the Standing Committee on Sustainable Development of the Inter-Parliamentary Union. It's my pleasure to introduce Ms. Parag, who will give remarks on behalf of the President of the Cooperative Republic of Guyana. Welcome, Ms. Parag. through the Guyana Online Academy of Learning, and to Mr. Kit Nascimento, Dr. Henry, and all of the officials who are here representing that university as well as Guyana, who on the Guyanese part of things, who have organized this event. And last but not least, all of you students who are here, because it's so important that at every opportunity that we have regarding any issue that is national that we be able to address you. On behalf of His Excellency Dr. Muhammad Irfan Ali, who really, really up to the very last moment wanted to be here, or at least wanted to address you himself, uh, was unable to do so because of other pressing issues, of course. And so it is my distinct honor <coughs> to speak to you on behalf of His Excellency and on behalf of the government of Guyana in relation to the Venezuela-Guyana controversy. And I am very specific in my use of the word controversy. For you to begin to understand what we are facing today, you would necessarily have to go back to what the history is of this issue that led up to this point. And so it is very important that we understand all the facts and we separate all the facts from all of the propaganda so that we can make or come to an informed conclusion on this issue. Now, the Guyana Venezuela border controversy became an issue in the latter part of the 19th century or what we know as the 1800s. And even before I start with all of that history, there are two things that I believe is necessary for me to say from the onset. One is that Esequibo belongs to Guyana. Without a doubt, Esequibo belongs to Guyana. 
And I'm not just saying that because I'm Mesopotamian. I'm saying that because I'm Guyanese. The second thing is, we want to let our armed forces, our Guyana Defense Force, our joint services, know how proud we are of them for the patriotic stand that they have taken and the sacrifices that they are making. Even today, where we are not yet certain of a full conflict happening, but they are taking a lead, and we are very proud of them for that fact. You know, Guyana has always thread on a path of peace. We have always used the avenue of peace. We have always used the avenue of diplomacy. We have always used the avenue and as a government, we have always used the avenue of pursuing, especially when it comes to an issue like this, pursuing and adhering to the rule of law. In this particular case, international law. This is why we believe that anything that Venezuela decides to do, they will not succeed because we have always done what is right and what is lawful. So back to the history, in the latter part of the 19th century, when the United States did not think that Great Britain or the United Kingdom at that time should make territorial claims in this part of the hemisphere. And as a matter of fact, Venezuela thought that. And Venezuela approached the United States to assist them or to be on their side to say to the UK, you cannot come and take territory here. But Venezuela itself wanted far more than it had at the time. So through what is called the Monroe Doctrine, the United States invoked the clauses of the Monroe Doctrine and forced the United Kingdom to go to arbitration. Where there was an arbitration trial, an arbitral tribunal set up, established to deal specifically with this issue. Guyana at the time was still a colony and so the United Kingdom, being forced, submitted to that tribunal. Both parties agreed at that time. It's, on, it's, it's important for you to understand that. Both parties consented and agreed or agreed at that time that the outcome or the conclusion or the decision of what that arbitration or arbitral tribunal will make will be the full, the perfect, and the final decision. Those words were even agreed upon by both parties and incorporated into that decision. More than 200 hours, extensive submissions were made during that period. And at the end of that, it was concluded, the borders, the, the boundaries of Venezuela and Guyana was decided upon by that tribunal. It was decided upon by that tribunal. And both parties accepted that decision. It was called an arbitral award. An arbitral award of 1899. So our history of what the Guyana map is, 
what our borders are was established since 1899 by that arbitral award. Venezuela accepted that. Guyana or the United Kingdom at that time accepted that. And for 60, over 60 decades or over 60 years, that arbitral award was deemed valid. It still is as far as Diane is concerned. And it was accepted so much by Venezuela that they went to Parliament and they incorporated that in their laws. And as a result of incorporating that in their laws, their map was drawn to show the borders that were demarcated by that arbitral award. So Venezuela themselves accepted from 1899 onwards to the 1960s that this was what Guyana, this is what Guyana is, this is what Venezuela is. And mind you, Venezuela got a huge territory from that arbitral award. Far larger than Diana as a result of that arbitral award. So today we can honestly conclude that one of the driving forces behind this referendum and behind Venezuela's tactics is greed. As we approach independence, as Diana approached independence, Somewhere there about to 1961 to 1962, as independence came into sight for us, Venezuela decided that they wanted to raise this issue again. Or a way, I don't know what they wanted to do. They wanted to have it dug up. A matter that was established and laid to rest by a legal and judicial body. And they wanted to unilaterally repudiate the 1899 Arbitral Award. What does that mean? It means that they wanted to act on their own to say that this 1899 Award, after 60 years of accepting it, was no longer valid. Without, without any form of evidence or any kind of credible information. And up to today's date, that is the situation. Up to today's date, that remains. But doing an act like that puts the entire world in limbo. It puts the entire world in a state of confusion, or it has the potential to do that. Why? Because any country in any part of the world can decide that they're going to wake up tomorrow and they're going to say, a piece of your land belongs to me. And I don't have to adhere to what court order or decision from a tribunal was made 60 odd years ago. Never mind every single step of that arbitra arbitral award and arbitral process was documented to a T. And that is why we can today refer to all of what transpired then because of the well-documented records that were there. Never mind you have all of that, but a country can get up and decide on their own that they want to come and take a territory irrespective of the rule of law, irrespective of a decision made by a legal decision made by a judicial body. And where does that leave us in the world? Where does that leave us? It means that no country is safe. It means any country has to now think, is my neighbor who I've lived peacefully with for 60 odd years and at some point would have had a neighborly relationship, decided they're going to get up today and say, a portion of your yard is mine. Never mind you got papers made. 
It's like a man who has a transport or a man who has a title, and the title demarcates the boundaries of your land, or it shows you the it shows you the dimension of your land. But the man next door, and this is properly passed by a registry and properly passed by the body of authority. But the man next door, although his transport got his own dimensions, he decided he's going to wake up, disregard what you have, and take a piece of your land. How can that make sense? Or how can we ever be safe in a world where somebody thinks like that? We can't. We cannot. But it is very important for you to understand that Diana has always, we have never shied away from taking the legal process, we have never shied away from taking a course of peace and diplomacy, because guess what? We are that kind of people, we are that kind of country, and we will, we will at all costs preserve our peace, maintain our peace, and not only for us, but for the rest of the region. Because we want our country to be an example to the rest of the world. We want our country to be an example to the rest of the world. So as we approach independence, and for you to be a signatory to the Geneva Agreement, which I'm sure you have heard of so many, so many times now, because everybody's talking about these agreements and everybody's talking about all of the, um, the, the, the what we have, what we are signatories to. For you to have been a signatory to the Geneva Agreement, you would have had to be in an independent state. But the United Kingdom signed on to the Geneva Agreement. And when Guyana became independent in 1966, Guyana became a signatory to that agreement as Guyana, not as a colony, but as an independent state. And so now, the battle was between Guyana and Venezuela. But by that Geneva Agreement, you had certain processes. Now, this process, the good offices process, set out by the Geneva Agreement, of which Guyana took part and Venezuela took part, was not an acceptance of the 1899 Arbitral Award being invalid. And it is important for you to understand that because people want to know why Guyana continued, continued to listen to that and continue to, to pursue that. But the United Nations decided that they were going to explore or examine the request made by Venezuela. Not to definitively see that the 1899 award was invalid, but to examine what they were seeing. And so we went through the good offices, good offices process. And the matter was laid to rest, or you call it a moratorium, it was laid to rest for 12 years. And in 2017, in 2017 when nothing was being done, the matter came back up. Guyana decided that, look, we need to invoke the office of the UN Secretary General. And the UN Secretary General exploring his a solution to the matter, had the authority under the Geneva Agreement to say that I am going to recommend and suggest and refer this matter to the International Court of Justice. The UN Secretary General had that authority and that power under the Geneva Agreement to determine where the matter can go for a solution. 
and so the matter went to the ICJ. The question before the ICJ, or the decision or the determination that the ICJ has to make, and will make sometime in January, is whether the 1899 arbitral award is valid. Up to today's date, Venezuela has never produced any evidence to say that that 1899 arbitral award was arrived at through fraud or by fraud, as they claim. They have not put forward any sort of evidence why this matter should even be re-examined or examined. Examined or re-examined. Venezuela, knowing that it has a weak case, decided that they're going to challenge the jurisdiction of the ICJ. And the ICJ almost unanimously ruled that it has the jurisdiction to hear this matter. And so the matter continues, continued. And when they unanimously rule that, it matters not if Venezuela shows up. Matters not if Guyana shows up. They have to go through with the matter because they have the jurisdiction, the matter is before them. The decision will be handed down in January. But as we were, as the court ruled that, and even before then, Venezuela started its intimidation tactics towards Guyana and its aggression towards Guyana for many years since 1962. And Guyana has always, in all of those decades, all of those decades, followed the rule of law because we are a democratic country. And we understand that when you are in a democratic state, that you adhere to the rule of laws. If you have, we also understand that as a nation, we have to coexist peacefully with our neighbors. If we have a neighbor that is undemocratic and has consistently been undemocratic, and has by its action shown us that it's undemocratic, then the natural thing to do for us is to try to maintain the peace, but at the same time, take all steps necessary to protect our territorial integrity or sovereignty. So as a result of Guyana, Venezuela's aggression towards Guyana, Guyana approached the International Court of Justice for provisional measures to prevent Venezuela from carrying out their threats in their, memor their referendum. And let's go to this referendum. Venezuela, having lost as it relates to the jurisdiction of the court, decided that they were going to take matters in their own hands and create a referendum. What is important for you to understand at this stage is that a referendum is not unlawful. A country can have a referendum. It is the content of that referendum that determines whether it is unlawful or not. And if there is content in that referendum that threatens the peace of a region or of another territory or threatens the, so the sovereign rights, the territorial integrity or territorial sovereignty of another nation, as far as I'm concerned, it becomes unlawful. And the referendum states, particularly Articles 3 and 5, do you agree with Venezuela's historical position of not recognizing the jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice to resolve the territorial controversy over Guyana or Essequibo? And Article 5 says, Do you agree with the creation of the Guyana Essequibo State 
and the development of an accelerated plan for comprehensive care for the current and future population of that territory, which includes, among, other, among others, the granting of citizenship and identity, uh, identity card. Venezuela, in accordance with the Geneva Agreement and International Law, consequently incorporating said, said state on the map of Venezuelan territory. Now, this Article 5 has so many lies to it. First of all, Venezuela is not acting in accordance with the Geneva Agreement. The Geneva Agreement allowed the matter to be explored. It allowed the UN Secretary General to state the course that is to be taken for a solution, which is the International Court of Justice. Venezuela has departed, has departed fully from the legal process of what the ICJ will go through and has taken matters into their own hands by unilaterally trying to annex our territory. From this referendum, that is what these questions are programmed. They are programmed for their population to say yes. And on the basis of that, they may or may not act. Diana remains hopeful, we remain hopeful that good sense will prevail, that diplomacy will still prevail, and that Venezuela will accept the decision of the ICJ as the final and definitive decision and that they will not continue their aggression towards Guyana. As I stand here on behalf of the government, I cannot tell you that you should not be concerned because people will be concerned anyway. What I can tell you is that this is one of the issues that every Guyanese is standing together. We are standing in solidarity. Gaia, the government, as well as the opposition, and the people of Guyana, we have one position as it relates to this matter. One position. And it is that Esequibo belongs to Guyana. Our position also remains that we will continue to walk the path of legality and walk the path of peace. But although I have said that, and though I have said that, and I have I've said that, we will not allow any stone to be left unturned in protecting our territory. The international community have come out and they have condemned CARICOM, the Commonwealth, the OAS, have all used strong language in condemning Venezuela's aggression. And outright states that it's a threat to the peace, it's a threat to the region. So the international community is standing with Guyana because we have never done anything wrong. We have not done anything wrong in, with regards to this issue. We have continued. We have continued through the channel of diplomacy. We have continued to pursue every good governance that we have signed on to in every treaty. And we, will, we want to thank the international community for their unwavering support for Guyana and their consistent support for Guyana in relation to this issue. I have seen many, many, I've seen many condemnations, but the strongest that I've seen is in relation to this issue. And while we walk that path of peace, again, 
we will stop at nothing to protect our territory. We will ensure that as Guyanese, we remain Guyanese in all 83,000 square miles of Guyana. And Essequibo, which is however you want to look at it, whether it's two thirds or three quarters, because that's what, the, that's what Venezuela is claiming that they want to annex. Whether it's two thirds or three quarters, it belongs to us. It belongs to us as a nation. Not as me being as Equibian as you being from Demerara, you being from Barbies. Any part of Guyana that is threatened affects all of us as Guyanese. And today I wanted to share that with you and I wanted to reassure you that the government is doing all that it can do and has to do in relation to this matter, in relation to protecting our territorial integrity. I want to reassure you that we will stand together, united, throughout the days to come, in the face of any adversity, as a country. And I want to also encourage you to trust the government, to trust your armed forces to stand up for you. I thank you for listening because I believe all categories of Guyanese, it doesn't matter how young you are or how old you are, this is an issue that is historic for us. It's an issue that you will remember 20 years down the line you're the next generation, the next generation will refer to it. And you're a part of history. You're a part of the, what is going to be the most recent history of this country. And it is for all of us to come Friday and come Sunday to unite and show the world what Guyanese United in Harmony looks like. So we encourage you to also participate in all of the activities that we have in the schools, in the government agencies, in the private sector. We encourage you to do the day of prayer. We encourage you on Sunday to form that circle of unity. We all have responsibilities for different regions and we will be in our regions standing with the people and you can do it from wherever you are. You can do it from wherever you are. The point is, we are taking that day to ensure that Guyana is seen for what it is. A unified nation, a nation of peace, a nation that will always, always uphold democracy and the rule of law. But we are also not a weak nation. That is not to say that we are going to roll over and take anything. We are a resilient people and we will do all that is necessary again. This is the last reassurance from me for today. We will do all that we will have to do to protect our country. So Guyanese, we stand together and as Equibo belongs to us. Thank you on behalf of His Excellency and the government of Guyana.
and I should separate the facts from the government. And I like that. And you, you also one, gave a clear historical background, and you made made it a point where you listed two points. Essequibo belongs to Guyana. Essequibo is a part of the 83,000 square miles. And also how proud you are and the government is of the armed forces, which is important to all of us. We have heard that Guyana has taken all and is taking all parts towards peace, negotiation, diplomacy, because Guyana wants to be an example to the rest of the world. And um, today, my friends, I believe we got a full lesson on international relations, territorial sovereignty, integrity. And finally, I am glad that the international community, CARICOM, the OAS, the Commonwealth, stands behind Guyana. And this says a lot. For, for Guyana itself and the Guyanese people. And then, Minister, I thank you very much for your presence. And I am I'm, I'm hoping that you will be able to stay when there are a few questions to be asked. Thank you so much. At this time, I would like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Clement Henry, who will be speaking on the topic a constructivist analysis of the Guyana-Venezuela border dispute. Most of you will know Dr. Henry. He, has, he got his PhD in international relations from the UWI. I should say first he got his bachelor's degree from Andrews University, his master's from UG, and his PhD from UWI. And he is here to give us a constructivist approach to this controversy. Let me welcome Dr. Clement Henry. Dr. Okay, Henry? Good morning and thank you. Good morning and thank you for the introduction, Master of Ceremony, Honorable Minister, Mr. Massimento, and colleague presenters, those in the virtual space, and those present in the room today. It's indeed a pleasure to, to present to you on the constructivist analysis of the Guyana Venezuela border controversy. My focus today is simply academic. I intend to merely rehash some of the historical information which was well presented by the minister, just to give the context towards the presentation today. So join with me as we embark on an exploratory expedition into the entangled and enigmatic elements of the Guyana-Venezuela border controversy. I have subtitled this presentation, A Constructivist Canvas, Deciphering the Dynamics of the Guyana-Venezuela Border Controversy. In the intricate tapestry of international relations, constructivism emerges as a critical lens through which we can unravel the complex threads of this long-standing controversy. Like artists interpreting a landscape, I intend to paint a picture of how the subjective states of mind molded by historical narratives, social context, and political perceptions color the canvas of conflicting ideas, interests, and interests between two nations. In this constructivist critique, I aim to illuminate not just the apparent, but the abstract, 
the unseen on the currents of social constructs that shape and shadow the geopolitical gestures and gambits of Guyana and Venezuela. So for a brief background, for Guyana and Venezuela, the controversy over Venezuela's claim of the Escobo region cannot be understood without considering the historical context from which it emerges. The Guyana-Venezuela border controversy really paints a picture of vulnerability and vehemence. The roots of this relentless rivalry reach back to the 19th century, embroiled in Venezuela's rejection of Schomburg's cartography. Venezuela's vested, vested in vigor and vast in vision emerge as an assertive aggressor, challenging the chalked out contours of the 1899 Accord with tempestuous tenacity. When we consider Venezuela towering in its military might and, 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 and its territorial size compared to Guyana, a youthful state yearning for its trajectory of tranquil economic and social development, we see a, a kind of David and Goliath um, scenario. Despite the signing of the 1966 UN-sponsored Geneva Agreement by both parties to the conflict, Venezuela continued to display belligerence even though it sometimes seemed to, sorry, despite the signing of the 1966 UN-sponsored Geneva Agreement by both parties to the conflict, Venezuela's display of belligerence indicates that the country will continue to be a threat to Guyana's territorial integrity. This remains so despite visits to Guyana by past President Hugo Chavez, now deceased, and the current President Nicolas Maduro. Amidst the tumultuous time, Guyana garners global goodwill through its gravitation towards international jurisprudence. Guyana has referred Venezuela's challenge to its territory to the International Court of Justice, which we see as a quest for a peaceful solution to this controversy. Let, let me introduce the concept of, of constructivism in international relations. Alexander Wendt, in a seminal article, Anarchy is What States Make of It, at the end of the Cold War, marked a transformative moment in international relations theory. Wendt's constructivism challenges traditional IR theories with the view which view anarchy as a fixed objective reality dictating states behavior. According to Wendt, anarchy is not a preordained structure but is a construct but is constructed by states themselves through their interaction and shared understandings. In international relations, anarchy is a fundamental, uh, anarchy is fundamentally defined as the absence of a central authority or overarching government that governs the interaction among states. The concept is pivotal in the field of international relations, particularly in the theories of realism, liberalism, and constructivism. In the context of IR, anarchy does not imply chaos or disorder. Rather, it denotes a system where no single entity or authority has power to enforce rules or norms 
universally. In this system, states are sovereign entities that act independently with the primary responsibility of their own security and interests. IR theories such as realism and liberalism offer differing perspectives on state behavior under anarchy. Realism sees states as security maximizing entities in a self-help system, while liberalism advocates for cooperation among states for survival. Went in constructivism, however, posits that, they, that these theories overlook the dynamic nature of, of, of state behavior and the importance of ideational factors. So let us, let us metaphorically consider international relation and anarchy as the uncharted ocean, the void of a central governing authority where states sail sovereign ships charting their own course. This metaphorical maritime milieu is interpreted diversely by different theoretical lenses in international relations. In realism, anarchy is the ominous ocean where no overarching authority reigns. States akin to ships must navigate these treacherous tides alone. Their survival dependent on their own strength and strategy. Realism views this anarchic arena as inherently hazardous, a realm of relentless rivalry where trust is tenuous and the quest for power paramount. States in realist reckoning are perpetually preparing for a potential peril as peace is but a precarious pause in the perpetual play for power. Liberal, liberalism, on the other hand, perceives this ocean of anarchy with a tint of optimism. It posits that through cooperation, communication, and the construction of international institutions, this tumultuous tide of, an of anarchy can be tamed. With liberal lens, the anarchic ocean is not necessarily a domain of doom, rather it can be a space where states, through dialogue and diplomacy, can sail together towards a horizon of harmony and mutual prosperity. How, how, how do constructivists conceive anarchy? Constructivism, on the other hand, contemplates anarchy not as fixed, not as a fixed feature of, international, of the international system, but as a fluid and formative force shaped by shared beliefs and be, be shared by shared beliefs, behaviors, and identities of the states navigating these waters. In this perspective, the ocean of anarchy is more a mirror reflecting the collective constructions and conceptions of its voyages. Constructivism contends that the nature of this anarchy or the nature of this anarchic ocean is not preordained but it is perpetually penned and repenned through interaction and interrelation of states. If states see the seas as stormy and perilous, they will sail defensively and distrustfully. However, if they view these waters as waves of opportunity for cooperation, they will navigate more neighborly. The constructivist perspective thus brings a breadth of subjectivity to the understanding of anarchy. 
It underscores that the international system, like a great sea, is shaped by the perceptions and practices of those who traverse its tides. Anarchy, in this sense, is not an unchangeable condition, but a canvas constantly colored by the collective and changing conceptions of the states at sea. So, Mr. Chair, constructivism asserts that state behavior is not static, but dynamic and context dependent. This theory emphasizes the role of ideas, identities, and interests in shaping the state's actions. States are not invariably aggressive, as realists would argue, or inherently cooperative, as liberals would propose, but behave in ways that reflect their individual identities and the meanings they ascribe to the international system. Constructivists also contends that norms and beliefs prevalent in the international system and within individual states play a critical role in shaping amity or friendship or enmity or foes. For example, states subscribing to similar norms of democratic governance might naturally ally more closely, fostering amity or friendship, as we heard in the minister's presentation, describing Guyana's identity as a state that, that promotes democracy and friendship and international cooperation as a, as a part of its national identity. On the other hand, Venezuela is demonstrating itself to be a state that is not adhering to international norms and convention. And therefore, it's easy for relationship of enmity or, or relationship of foe to develop between Venezuela and a neighboring state. Domestic politics and social factors in each state can also influence amity or enmity in constructivist perspective. Public opinion, the role of the media, cultural ties, and domestic political ideologies can shape the state's foreign policy preferences and its perception of others, other states. I will now look at the Guyana Venezuela border controversy in the context of constructivism. And I want to make uh, uh, six points drawn from the history and, and, and the contemporary situation. So the first one I want to make in terms of the constructivist analysis is that socially constructed ideas and, 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 and perceptions can influence the way these states respond to each other. From a constructivist viewpoint, the identities of Guyana and Venezuela are not static, but have evolved through historical interactions, colonial legacies, and domestic political narratives. Venezuela is trying to present its territorial claim over a significant part of Guyana as an expression of its national identity and perception of historical injustices against them by imperialists, as is observed in its effort to not attack Guyana per se, but Exxon. So what Venezuela is trying to do, and wrongly trying to do, is to claim victim status by saying, creating the identity of, 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 of a victim by saying that this international imperialist-linked uh, organization is trying to take away what is rightfully Venezuela. And this appears to be deeply, deeply rooted in, 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 in Venezuela's historical narrative and its identity construction. For Guyana, it's a matter of defending its territorial integrity. Its identity is linked towards uh, 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 a, a nation combined, co uh, uh, consisting of three counties, Esukebo, Damawara, and, and, and Berbiz, 
and, 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 and its identity is built around trying to protect its territorial integrity against a larger neighbor. Guyana's deeply rooted identity as a small developing state compliant with international rules and norms facing existential security threat from a powerful neighbor is the, the picture that, that, that we present as a nation, as, as, as Guyana seeks to, to, to attain the support of the international community in this controversy against Venezuela. A second point uh, in, in the analysis, constructivist analysis, is the role of domestic politics in shaping Venezuela's foreign policy towards Guyana. The Venezuelan government's emphasis on territorial claims could be interpreted as a strategy to consolidate national unity and distract its residents and citizens from the domestic issues. Constructivists suggest that states often engage in external conflicts to manage its internal challenges. Dominguez et al. contend that the Guyana-Venezuela controversy, like other territorial controversies in Latin America, has endured because of enduring domestic political support. Maduro is clearly using territorial claims to gain political mileage since pursuing them serve to validate his nationalist credentials. Must of support for his political party during the upcoming, uh, during the upcoming difficult election seasons, or maybe to boost his public support during this time of his declining uh, popularity. So what we, what we see coming out here in, in, is that from is that domestic politics can influence uh, a country's stance towards its neighbor. And, and, and it's clear here with Maduro facing all of these domestic challenges, trying to distract this population for them to look outwards rather than inwards. Venezuela's domestic political landscape characterized by economic challenges, political polarization, and social unrest has significantly influenced its aggressive foreign policy towards Guyana. The presence of oil and other natural resources in Essequibo adds a material dimension to the controversy. Thomas in 2016 indicates that historical evidence corroborates a close connection between oil located in border areas, conflict, and interstate wars. Oil and mineral resources, causal role in border disputes, have been acknowledged in a number of cases, including those between Bolivia and Peru, Nigeria and Cameroon, Ecuador and Peru, and Argentina and Chile. Claire contends that beyond the ideological-based Cold War, control of valuable natural resources became the primary motivation of interstate conflicts in the 80s. Randall and Ishmael in 2010 claimed that the resurfacing of the border controversy uh, between Guyana and Venezuela was really linked to the resource potential of the Essequibo and its associated maritime space. However, from a constructivist perspective, the importance of these resources is not just economic, but also symbolic, representing national pride and sovereignty. The conflict or controversy over resources thus become a part of, of the national narrative and identity for both countries. The role of international norms and institutions. Guyana's reliance on international norms and support and its appeal to the International Court of Justice reflects a con constructivist understanding 
of international relations where international law and norms shape state behavior and provide mechanisms for conflict resolutions. As an independent, impartial body, the ICJ's involvement lends legitimacy to the resolution process. Its decisions are widely respected and carry significant weight in the international community, which can be crucial for ensuring compliance by involved parties. Mr. Chair, decisions by the ICJ are binding and final, which means they're expected to be respected and implemented by the parties involved. This finality can provide a clear and conclusive end to this long-standing controversy. Venezuela, in the last two decades, has sought to boost its military power and reconfigure strategic alliances within the Caribbean region through the use of petrol diplomacy. One author reports that on the Chavez, Venezuela buttressed its military capabilities, becoming Latin America's, on a per capita expenditure basis, the largest arms importer. Venezuela's military acquisitions include Sukhoi fighter aircraft, transport aircraft, assault helicopters, diesel submarine, large radar, uh, and, 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 and missile defense system. In a constructivist understanding, military expansion is not just a material strategy, but a symbolic action. It serves as a tool for internal and external identity construction. Domestically, it reinforces the government's image of strength and sovereignty, especially in the face of internal political challenges. Internationally, it projects Venezuela as a formidable player in the region, potentially deterring external intervention and influencing regional dynamics. On the foreign policy front, the petrol Caribbean Framework Agreement represents a key strategy by Venezuela to mobilize regional support. petrol Caribbean was essentially a bilateral energy cooperation agreement which provided preferential payment arrangements for petroleum and petroleum products to Caribbean and Latin American countries. Under the petro Caribbean Agreement, Venezuela sought to create regional alliances and influence. Constructivism views this as part of Venezuela's strategy to shape regional perception and identities in a way that supports foreign policy goals. Venezuela's external posture can be seen as a manifestation of its complex social identity. On the one hand, it asserts a, a, a friendly, cooperative identity towards its, neighbor, its neighbors, reflecting its claims of amity through its petrol diplomacy. On the other hand, it maintains a strong, assertive national identity underscored by military expansion. This duality can be understood as a strategy to balance its image as a regional leader that is both cooperative and powerful. My final point on the controversy as I try to interpret it in a, from a constructivist lens is this. While Venezuela invasion is not impending, the country may opt to use bad non-state actors in the Guyana-Venezuela border controversy. This illustrates how states can employ 
asymmetric strategies to advance their interests while circumventing direct confrontation and overt violation of international norms. From a constructivist perspective, the use of non-state actors allows Venezuela to craft a dual identity, one that is outwardly compliant with international norms, maintaining an image of non-aggression, and on the other hand, it is more covertly aggressive, asserting its claim over the, the Escobo region. This duality aligns with the concept of plausible deniability, enabling Venezuela to navigate the international system by disassociating itself from direct aggression while still exerting influence in the disputed, in the, in the area of controversy. This approach reflects the fluid and constructive nature of state identities in constructivist theory. The activities of these bad non-state actors, for example, syndicatos, can, can, can lead to security destabilization in the region. By creating a security vacuum and intimidating local population, these groups these bad non-state groups can indirectly challenge the established norms of sovereignty and governance in the region. This destabilization can be interpreted as an attempt by Venezuela to reshape the local narrative and perception of control, potentially justifying further intervention under the guise of stabilization and protection. For Guyana, responding to these challenges involves navigating a complex interplay of internal governance, national and citizen security, and international diplomacy. Constructivism highlights the importance of Guyana's identity as a sovereign state and its need to assert this identity both domestically and internationally. The response to these non-state actors is not just a matter of physical security, but also of reinforcing Guyana's sovereignty and legitimacy in the eyes of its citizen and the international community. I want to proffer a few recommendation, recommendations as I close. Number one, Guyana should continue to pursue its international legal approach. Continuing to engage with the International Court of Justice is a key strategy. By participating in the ICG process, Guyana demonstrates its commitment to international law and peaceful resolution. This approach gains legitimacy on the global stage and helps to ensure that any resolution is grounded in legal principles. Diplomatic engagement. Guyana should maintain strong diplomatic relations with a wide range of international actors, including neighboring countries, regional organizations like CARICOM and the OAS, and global powers. Regional and international networks provide support and potentially influence, can influence Venezuela's position. Engaging with multilateral organizations also helps in garnering international support and ensuring that Guyana's concerns are heard on a global platform. International consensus and stability. Politically, it is crucial for Guyana to maintain internal, uh, internal consensus on how to handle the dispute. A unified National stance strengthens Guyana's position in negotiations and in international forum. Further, furthermore, ensuring domestic stability and addressing any internal divisions related to the controversy can prevent Venezuela from exploiting internal dissent. 
public communication, and national unity. Effective, effective communication with the public about the nature of the controversy, the steps being taken, and the potential implications is essential. This transparency can foster national unity and a collective understanding of the importance of the controversy for national sovereignty. Defense and security preparedness. While pursuing peaceful resolution, Guyana should ensure that its defense and security measures are adequate. This is not to imply militarization of the dispute, but ensuring readiness to defend national sovereignty. And this is important in the context if, if Venezuela adopts the strategy of using these bad non-state actors such as uh, Sindicato and, 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 and other gangs to, to, to come over and destabilize the region. Ensuring that, 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 that we have defense and security preparedness can take care of that eventuality. Leveraging national resources. With the discovery of significant oil reserves, Guyana has an opportunity to leverage these resources in its diplomatic and economic strategies, ensuring that the management of these resources is seen as a matter of national interest by the international community. Much more, in CARICOM, Guyana should seek to counteract Venezuela's resource-based allure to its members by sponsoring joint development initiatives. And I think we're already leading in this area with, the discussion on, on, with our discussion on food security and there's possibility for expansion as we leverage our natural resources in terms of uh, in expanding our diplomatic influences. Environmental and indigenous rights consideration. In all actions, especially those involving the execrable and surrounding areas, Ghana as a country should consider and, and, and should continue along the path of environmental sustainability and the rights of the indigenous population, aligning with global norms so that Ghana can gain moral support. If Ghana continues to build that identity of a compliant nation, not only internationally, but domestically, it means that we can have, we can garner global support as a nation whose identity is built on rule of law domestically and internationally. And so, in, 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 in summary, the constructivist lens allows us to, to see the Guyana, Venezuela border controversy from a standpoint of, of the state's identity determining their action. Venezuela is trying, in all its, its, its messages, is trying to present itself as if it's a victim of some injustice. Really and truly, it is Guyana's identity as a, as a nation that hosts and sticks to the rule of law, a small state that is being bullied by its larger neighbor is what is gaining international traction. And we should continue to present this identity to the world so that we can continue to, to muster and garner international support in addressing this controversy. Folks, I thank you for, for listening the, to this presentation. Thank you very much. Dr. Henry, for your critical analysis, using the constructivist approach and taking us straight from our development straight to 2023. Um, just quickly to recap, uh, you did reinforce the need for dialogue and diplomacy, and it was it, it was it was good for us to see anarchy from the different theoretical constructs, and then see what constructivism says about anarchy, how it is constant, constantly 
being penned and shaped every day. Towards the end of your presentation, you made several recommendations related to transparency, defense and security preparedness, internal governance, international diplomacy, the role that the international organizations and other states could play in assisting Guyana in this controversy. You also spoke about leveraging natural resources and the sponsorship of joint initiatives and very well so the protection or the consideration of the environmental the, the you know the environmental considerations and of course the rights of indigenous peoples all in all you had some very sound recommendations which i believe we all would have taken note of at this juncture we will it's 11 17 we will have a 20 minute break and we will resume at uh, 11.40. All right, uh, our folks in in Guyana in uh, at the center, they have some snacks as well. So, well, they have some snacks, so they will be partaking of some of that. So we will resume at 11.40. Thank you very much so far, and we will continue 11.40.